The political guns are blazing in the latest standoff between President Cyril Ramaphosa and former spy boss Arthur Fraser, with the ANC's elective conference in December just around the corner. Fraser opened a case against Ramaphosa after a robbery that took place at the president's game farm in February 2020 was suspiciously never reported to the police. Instead, the Presidential Protection Unit undertook a private investigation into the matter. Fraser alleged that four million US dollars in cash was stolen from Ramaphosa's Palapala game farm in Limpopo, where he breeds and trades exotic game for millions of rands. I want to assure you, comrades, that all this was money from proceeds from selling animals. I have never stolen money from anywhere, be it from our taxpayers, be it from anyone, I've never done so. Fraser, meanwhile, is implicated in an investigation into corruption at the State Security Agency during and after his time as the Director General. I'm Amy Gibbings, a journalist for News 24's Multimedia Department, and you're listening to The Story. This week we'll be talking to News 24 investigative journalist Kyle Cowan, who will fill us in on all the details of the 2020 robbery, what happened, and who is implicated. We'll then discuss the political ramifications of the robbery itself and Fraser's timely accusations. You're listening to The Story. It's a podcast by News24. We'll speak to journalists and experts about the week's biggest story. This is what we saw, heard and uncovered this week. Carl is tuning in from our Joburg office. Thank you for joining us this morning, Carl. Thank you, Amy. Can you first explain everything we know about this robbery so far? We know very little. We know that five men who Arthur Fraser has identified as being a mix of Namibian citizens and South African citizens allegedly broke into the main farmhouse at Palapala on the evening of the 9th of February 2020 and then made off with an undisclosed or as yet unverified amount of cash allegedly in foreign currency. What we don't understand a lot about is really how these people became aware of the cash being in the farmhouse. So what Mr. Fraser alleges is that the president's domestic worker who worked inside the house may have alerted some people to the existence of the money. That sounds plausible. It's a story that I think that we've heard before as South Africans. Um, But after that, you know, everything becomes quite strange because then the men are allegedly you know, exchanging all this foreign currency at a small little shop in, in you know, the, in the Cape Town CBD, and then they're buying cars worth 700,000 rand and flats worth 2 million rand and living a, a quite a lavish lifestyle. And what Mr. Fraser alleges then happens is basically the president's head of protection is a police general by the name of Wally Ruder. He then according to Fraser, unlawfully constituted a team to investigate the break-in. And this is where he claims a cover-up happened because there's no actual case registered with police, but there was some kind of an investigation. Now, to put this in the proper context, almost everything that Arthur Fraser says in his affidavit is hearsay, i.e. he heard it from someone else and is now reporting it to the police. He doesn't have first-hand knowledge of this investigation. He wasn't actually involved in it, which is a problem, a legal problem, I think, that will have to be overcome at some point by the police and now investigating it. But what is very clear is that there was a break-in at the farm. The president has said as much. We don't know how much money was stolen, and we don't know if the five men that Mr. Fraser says were involved were actually involved. Does Mr. Fraser claim to have a well-informed source? He does. He claims that he's the source of all of his information was a member of the team that Major General Ruder established to investigate this seemingly off the books. Who that person is, we don't know, because he obviously doesn't name this person. But the question then does become, why does Mr. Fraser play the middleman here? Why is he the one that this person from Major Ruder's team approaches? And that leads me to the next logical thing, and that is that this is not the first time that Mr. Fraser has had links to someone who is making information public out of the heart of Ramaphosa's circle. 
News24 has previously reported about, you know, those who were suspected to have leaked emails surround, surrounding the CR17 campaign and how that person was also linked to Arthur Fraser. So this it starts to become quite a murky spy story very, very quickly. But the one thing we shouldn't lose sight of is that no matter who reported this, there is still one big problem. And why is the president sitting with so much cash at his house on a farm in Limpopo? Let's talk about that. Political analyst who writes for News24, Ralph Matecha, said this could be the biggest robbery in a private residence in modern history if the what is equivalent to 60 million rand, if that in fact is the right amount. What are the allegations around Ramaphosa failing to report this robbery and then having so much foreign cash just mm-hmm. stored in his home? It's He's endangering himself, the people that live there. It's mm-hmm. an enormous amount of money. What do we think about that? Well, it, it's a major problem no matter which way you look at it. So effectively, the official version that has come out of the Ramaphosa side of, of, of events so far is that he wasn't aware at the time that there were cash transactions being done at the farm. The money had been part of game transactions, the sale of cattle, and so on and so forth, and then had was supposed to be taken to the bank the next week and so on. Remember, the robbery happened on a Sunday evening on, on, on the 9th of February 2020. So there's, there, there's a, it seems plausible on the face of it when you look at it and they say, okay, well, there were some of these cash transactions and we hadn't just we just hadn't had time to get to the bank yet. But unfortunately, most of us live in the real world. And the real world tells us that, or experience of the real world rather, tells us that when you're dealing with politicians, the president of the country, and you're dealing with extremely large amounts of cash floating around, then it becomes an immediate risk. Because no matter what story the president tells to justify this cash being on his farm, he will never be able to escape reasonable suspicion that this money was either a bribe or money being paid to lobby him politically for policy or whatever. And then the question, of course, becomes, okay, was it really in foreign currency? So why are you dealing in foreign currencies when you're the president of South Africa? You know, all these sort of questions start coming up. Is it a violation of exchange controls? You know, why are you still dealing in cash when you're the president of South Africa? That's a major problem. It's a risk. It's a risk to us as South Africans. It's a risk to him. So he's going to have to really explain this properly. And unfortunately, this time around, the poor farm manager who allegedly did these transactions, I don't think the public is going to allow him to be the fall guy or to allow Major General Wally Ruder to be the fall guy. We are sick and tired in this country of our presidents getting away effectively with corruption and and other heinous deeds. So this time, Ramaphosa is really going to have to explain this to us properly in a way that is, you know, backed up with evidence, backed up with facts, that we can understand it. Anything less than that is the suspicion will never go away. Not to mention the likelihood that this cash was in an effort to evade tax, right? That's what most South Africans are thinking when they're spending all their or paying all their tax money every month and really feeling, you know, as prices in the country go up, people are actually so desperate. And it's a sensitive thing. Yeah, and it's it's not only sensitive, it's I think it's the president has an enormous duty, him being a very wealthy individual who has also, you know, had he has he's had a long corporate career as well prior to returning to politics. You know, I think that the onus is on individuals like Mr. Ramaphosa being the individual, not the president, to pay his dues to the country. While we are all, every month we look at our pay slips and we see how much tax we're paying over, and then we drive down the street and we hit a pothole and we we don't understand why basic things are not being delivered for our tax rands. And bearing in mind these are rich people problems, these are middle class problems, there are people who cannot afford to put food on their table. And our government is not doing enough to help those people. So what is Mr. Ramaphosa going to do to fix this? And the only way that he's going to fix this is full and accurate disclosures of the truth. Transparency. And then also, we it's been alleged that this money laundering, tax evasion, is an issue in this industry itself. Yes, yeah, so you, you, you can see why. Um, this is an industry where 
very wealthy individuals play. Um, I doubt that that you or I are going to be going to the president's farm this weekend when there's an auction to pay pay four hundred or five hundred thousand rand for for a for a bull or a cow. Um, it's just you know it, this is this is just something where the the wealthy one percent live you know and and play. When you're dealing with these kind of large transactions, you know cash moves around and you know it, it becomes part of the game. But South Africa, but South Africa has got a deeper problem. We are we have been flagged by international bodies that we are not doing enough to counter money laundering, that we're not doing enough to counter illicit money flows. We know that as South Africans, we know that a lot of illicit money flows happen inside the country. But what is also being spoken about here is cross-border illicit money flows. Stuff, this is where terrorists, this is how terrorist financing happens. You know, they, they move money around in illicit ways through illicit goods, stolen stolen goods or wildlife trades or these sort of things. The, the, the rhino poaching syndicates, for example, all of that is an example of illicit money flows. As a country, we have to step up and tighten controls on these practices. Otherwise, we risk being put on a bad list, a naughty list, by international financing institutions, and then South African companies and individuals are going to find it extremely hard to be able to move their money around or do business or get investment in. It's a serious, serious problem, and South Africa needs to step up its policing on these issues immediately or face that risk. And what makes this even worse is that our own president is not allegedly setting an example. And and then what? Tell us a bit about the suspects that have been identified in this case. We went out, I know you went out with a team in Joburg, I went out with a team in Cape Town trying to hunt down these suspects, doorstop them. We had addresses, we weren't sure if they were correct. We didn't get so lucky on our side, um, but we did discover that these people don't really have much in common. There might be a shared Facebook friend, but tell us what we know so far. Let's start with this. In in the affidavit that Mr. Fraser provided to police, he rather disgustingly sort of tries to cast a xenophobic trope over all of this by identifying all of the suspects as either um, Namibian citizens or from Namibia or connected to Namibia. I'm not exactly sure why Mr. Fraser did that, but that's I think that's that's something we need to discuss, but maybe at a later stage. What we've been able to figure out is that these men have lived in, you know, relatively modest lifestyles up until a couple of years ago. Um, we traced one of the individuals. He worked as a security officer in a reaction unit at a mine in Steelport in the north of the country, where effectively he worked there for a year. And what they what these reaction units do is they, they get sent in when mine workers are protesting to quell the protest or to protect the mine's infrastructure. It's not a well-paying job. It's not a job that many aspire to. Um, one of the other individuals was an Uber driver, which is you can be seen as a slightly more honorable profession, I suppose. But also, it's not a profession that you, you don't wake up one day and say, I, I, I wish I can be an Uber driver one day. It's a job that you do because you're capable of driving a vehicle well and you need to make money. You know, so this is, this is, these are the kind of individuals that we're dealing with. We did extensive backgrounds on, on each and every single one of these people. Um, over and above, you know, allegations from other media outlets reporting that what they were arrested for, you know, immigration violations in Namibia and then deported and so on and so forth. We really focused on what we could tell our readers about these individuals here at home in South Africa. And what we found is that, you know, these guys were not really, how can I say, to my mind, they appear to be what I would call an operator, someone who who lives and works on the fringes of the intelligence world or the security world. They're often pulled into certain things. And the reason for this is very simple. There are an unbelievable amount of fake addresses linked to these some of these individuals. Now, you either provide a fake address to a credit bureau because you don't want them to find you because you don't intend on paying your debts, or you don't want other people to actually know where you're living. So this is this is one of the clues that we found. But at the same time, we found, for example, that you know, Mr. Fraser said one of the guys bought a, a, a quite a fancy Volkswagen Tiguan um, with the money that had been stolen on the farm. But in actual fact, he had already posted the picture that Mr. Fraser attached to his affidavit to his Facebook account in September of 2018. So there's one factual problem there, and I'm not saying that Mr. Fraser, you know, Mr. Fraser couched this as this is the information he got from his source, um, but one would have thought that he might have looked into it a little bit. 
to my mind, and you know, obviously this is a debate within our team, but to my mind, I don't think these individuals have much to do with the robbery in and of itself, actually. Um, what I do believe is, is that they are somehow being presented as the people who are involved. And to back that up, there is evidence of them having, you know, spending 1.8 million rand cash on a flat in Blobergstrand, you know, almost a year after the robbery happened, or buying Golf GTIs, that sort of thing. So th- there's something very strange going on here, Amy. It's just going to take a long time, I think, for us to separate the wheat from the chaff. Because Fraser has alleged that these suspects were paid off 150,000 rand each by, by the investigators. Why, why would you pay someone? who's already stolen an enormous amount of money from you. Exactly. It, it, it doesn't make logical sense to me. So other people are suggesting to me, oh, but the 150,000 was for them not to go to the police and say that they were kidnapped and interrogated by this peop- these people pretending to be police officers. And in the same breath, Mr. Fraser is telling us that Mr. Wally Ruder, who is a police official, um, got people who were former and current police officers to do the investigation with him. Now, whether that was sanctioned or whether that's unlawful, I think that's up for debate. But the problem is, is that you can't accuse someone of pretending to be a policeman when he is a policeman, even if he shouldn't be involved in the investigation in the first place or if it should have been done through other channels. A policeman is a policeman. And if he wishes to take a suspect into custody for questioning, I think that's perfectly within Mr. Ruder's rights to have done that. Tell me a bit about our relationship on a national level with Namibia. What is the connection here? Is there suspicion around our president's relationship with the Namibian president? Yes. So the allegation that has come out, you know, in, in subsequent reporting of this, um, you know, by by other media outlets, particularly Ama Bungani, is that um, the Namibian president was involved somehow in this cover up in, in the sense that our president had allegedly asked him to to not investigate or to not ask too many questions, you know, that that sort of thing. I, I, I don't think that's terribly plausible. Um, you know, it sounds to me like a like a, a conspiracy theory. I think diplomatically, if the president did want to keep this quiet, there would have been other ways that he could have gone about this. Instead of speaking directly to the president, they could have got our police head to speak to that police head or our prosecutors to speak to those prosecutors, that sort of thing, if you really want to talk about cover-ups. Other than these men, these suspects, not having much in common, Emmanuel David is alleged to have been in a relationship with a domestic worker. So perhaps he is some, some central figure in terms of bringing these people together. Is there any information around that? So, so this, is, this is, again, one of those strange claims because Mr. David, to my knowledge, is married. I, did, I have not found any evidence that says that he even lived in the safer scale informal settlement as is alleged by Mr. Fraser. I think we have to understand something very clearly as South Africans. I'm not for a moment saying the burglary did not happen. The burglary did happen. I'm just saying that just because Mr. Arthur Fraser says it is so, we should not accept it as the gospel truth. You know, Julius Malema was out on TV the other day saying that we should, we must never credit, question the credibility of, of Arthur Fraser. Well, unfortunately for Mr. Malema, South Africans and journalists in particular have been questioning Mr. Fraser's credibility for more than a decade. He is a senior spy. He was in charge of the state security agency. This is not a man who, when he speaks, I believe a single word he says. I will double and triple check every single thing that Mr. Fraser says long before I report it as fact. Let's talk about Fraser. He himself is implicated in a corruption probe. Tell, tell, tell us a bit about that and then how this could actually be a well-timed political move in time for the elective conference we have around the corner in December. Yes, yeah, so, so this is the broader context. It's, it's an ANC elective year. ANC will go and uh, at the end, in December this year, they will go and choose a president again. And many are saying that Ramaphosa will, will survive this and continue on for a second term. But whenever there's an ANC elective year, we must view all these scandals through the ANC prism. And it's unfortunate because effectively then the country becomes obsessed with ANC internal battles. And an ANC internal battle becomes the reason why someone like Mr. Fraser decides to now, after two years of this robbery, and trust me, he knew about it before he went to go and report it in, on the 1st of June. He he now suddenly decides to do that now, in this year. So there's a couple of reasons for that. 
there's a forensic investigation that was recommended by the Mufamadi panel ongoing at the State Security Agency. Those forensic investigators, as News24 reported, have now passed security clearance and their investigation is starting. The investigative directorate is investigating allegations that were put before the Zondo Commission. The Zondo Commission's part, the part four of the Zondo Commission report is coming out. It's going to focus largely on state capture at the State Security Agency. There's also the matter of the arrest of the Guptas in Dubai. It, it's not coincidental that on Wednesday, Mr. Fraser opens this case and on Friday, the Guptas are arrested. Now, many people, conspiracy theorists, will want you to believe that, oh, the Guptas have been arrested to detract attention away from Fraser's claims. Incorrect on two fronts. Number one, the Gupta's arrest has been coming for a v much longer time than Mr. Fraser's case. And second of all, South Africans are capable of focusing on more than one thing at a time. We are not idiots. We are not stupid as a people, as a nation. We can focus on more than one issue at a time. And we can still hold President Ramaphosa accountable while we observe and wait for the Gupta family to be extradited to the country. So that's quite important, I think, for everyone to just be aware of. But Mr. Fraser is a different kettle of fish. Mr. Fraser is facing long-standing allegations of impropriety, malfeasance, nepotism around the, the principal agent network program that was established by the then National Intelligence Agency way back when, 2005, 6, 7, when he was a, a deputy director back then. Then Mr. Fraser leaves the SSA and he comes back in late 2016 and he's there until 2018. Now, very important, what happened when Mr. Fraser came back to the SSA? He was appointed as the Director General, and he oversaw a massive increase in the budget that the office of the Director General had to his, at his disposal while he was there. It went from 40-something million to more than 300 million rand. And what is being alleged by state security agency operatives who went before the Zondo Commission is that Mr. Fraser's centralized covert operations that he had been supposed to shut down, unlawful, unconstitutional covert operations that were done by the Special Operations Unit under Tulani Dlomo, and that he had then centralized them in his office and then managed those projects from there. That is what the investigative directorate is investigating. That is what the forensic investigators will be looking at. They'll be looking at simple things, PFMA violations. Did, did he act lawfully? Was he allowed to move money around the way he did? Was he allowed to spend money the way he did? And those are significant problems for, a, for, for someone like Mr. Fraser, who we know has kept files on every politician that has probably ever occupied a senior position in this country. He is going to be facing down the barrel of a loaded gun at some point on these issues administrative issues we're not even talking about the problems and the issues that 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 they got up to with these covert operations simple administrative things were you allowed to spend the money that you spent and the answer to that according to the people i speak to is no so where exactly does fraser fit in to the anc factions is it safe to assume that he is not within ramaphosa's faction of things i, I don't think it's safe to assume anything about mr fraser and and i'll tell you why for a long time now, we have been told stories that around the 2017 elective conference where President Cyril Ramaphosa eventually became the ANC president, that Mr. Fraser, who was then the director general of the SSA, flipped, is to use the colloquial term, and actually helped the CR17 campaign because of security concerns, etc. And this may explain why he was then given a soft landing as you know the Department of Correctional Services Commissioner. I don't know if any of that's true. That could just be speculation by my sources. But what we do know are several facts. We do know that Mr. Fraser was somehow involved in the leaking of the so-called spy tapes to Zuma's legal team. He was called Zuma spy at one point. He had effectively saved Zuma's career. He had saved him from going to jail. Now he is again involving himself seemingly to the benefit of people who may still be loyal to former President Jacob Zuma. So there, there's a strange sort of correlation between the things that Fraser does and, you know, things that benefit Zuma loyalists or the RIT faction, as some people call them. But that's not to say that if it becomes politically expedient, if Mr. Fraser can strike some kind of a political deal that will, not, that will see him not prosecuted for any of the crimes he's accused of, it's not to say that he will not turn on, you know, those loyal to former President Jacob Zuma or Jacob Zuma himself. That's the problem when you deal with spies, is that they will probably do at the end of the day what's best for them. And the main focus here is, of course, is not queen and country, as they say. This is not 
you know, some sort of effort to protect the South African Republic from whatever. Because if it was, Mr. Fraser would have reported these allegations a long time ago, and he wouldn't have waited for the, the opportune political moment or when it suited him best. So we need to understand this context. Mr. Fraser is not doing this because he's a patriot. He's doing this for some other reason, and we are yet to completely understand why. I think you made a good point earlier in that we become, as South Africans, so caught up in these political battles that they end up diverting the attention from the things that really matter. Even if Fraser has these intentions, what happened at Ramaphosa's farm is also problematic. But now we're focusing, you know, so that that is the issue. The infighting takes center stage. And then these very important issues, we kind of become used to them. It's like, oh, another mm. corruption. Oh, another money laundering. And, and we get used mm. to hearing these things, which is the real tragedy. But tell me, what yep. do you foresee to come out of this? What's next? Mm. Where do you see this, this landing? We, we've seen the story before. Remember, Shortly after President Ramaphosa assumed office, news broke around the 500,000 rand donation that the former Basasa CEO Gavin Watson had paid to his CR17 campaign. And he weathered that political storm quite well. It obviously wasn't such a big deal as this. I, I, th I think that, you know, the theft of so much cash from your, from your farmhouse is a bit much bigger problem than a dodgy donation. You know, um, but this is going to become extremely uncomfortable for President Ramaphosa. But for those in the opposition benches or for those South Africans expecting the ANC to undergo some sort of moral cleansing and decide to stand up against the president, just rewind back to what happened with former President Jacob Zuma. Even as revelations of state capture were coming out, the ANC MPs in Parliament voted to keep the man on at least two occasions. So don't get your hopes up that the ANC caucus is now going to somehow turn around and vote him out. That's just not going to happen. What is going to happen is, is that Ramaphosa's political agenda is going to be slightly destabilized. Whether that's going to affect the running of the country or not remains to be seen. But this is not the first leak that will come out this year, and it definitely won't be the last. I fully suspect that prior to December this year, there's still going to be quite a few things that will come out that will be damaging to Ramaphosa's you know, sort of hopes and dreams to re maintain his second term. I think he'll probably retain it, but whether he sees it out to the end is a different story. And unfortunately, we saw this with CR17 as well. When Ramaphosa's political opponents were starting to fight dirty with all these leaks and giving information out to the public and to certain media houses and so on, the Ramaphosa camp was very slow to respond. So and, and, and not only respond in if the official sense in terms of quelling the accusations or so on, but also in, in, in fighting back, you know, in simply just doing, fighting the game and getting some hands dirty and, and dishing the dirt on, on, their, on their political opponents. And this is what another thing that South Africans must always remember is that the ANC looks after the ANC. People inside the ANC look after each other. When you read about scandals in the media, about procurement problems or so on, it's usually because of, three reasons. One, because some or other journalist spent time and effort in trying to understand a certain tender or deal or problem and picked up corruption, or a whistleblower stepped forward, or a political opponent stepped forward. So th this is the problem that we have. Whether Ramaphosa is going to survive this or not, I, I, I wouldn't hold my breath that anyone's going to be voting him out of office anytime soon. But it's going to get messy, and there's probably going to be a lot more leaks before the end. If it weren't so depressing and to our detriment as a country, I'd almost want to get my popcorn out and enjoy the show before December because it's sure going to, to get more exciting and, and edgy, I suppose. But that's all we have time for um, today. That was very interesting, Carl, with your wealth of knowledge around, um, around this topic and others. Um, thank you so much for joining us. That was Carl Cowan, News24 investigative journalist. That's all we have time for this week. I'm Amy Gibbings, producer and host of The Story. Join us next Saturday for a discussion on the week's biggest story.